Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Short Term Show special episode series on Branson, Missouri, where we are doing a 10 episode deep dive on how to buy a short term rental in Branson. So we've got a few supplemental materials for y'all in addition to the content on this podcast over on our website. So any questions you have about purchase prices and searching properties, you can do that on our website. We also have the AirDNA data, thanks to our friends over at AirDNA, income data uh, on properties in Branson. So you can find these things at theshorttermshop.com. So www.theshorttermshop.com purchase prices and income data. If you want to buy a short-term rental property with a short-term shop agent in Branson, you can email us at agents at the short-term shop.com. Or if you just like us, you just want to hang out with us more. There's a few ways you can do that and join our Facebook group. It's the same title as my book. It's called short-term rental, long-term wealth. We're over there talking about short-term rental investing all day, every day. Or if you prefer to talk to us in person or virtual person, you can join our Zoom call that we have every Thursday. You can sign up for that at strquestions.com. We'll catch you guys over there. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Short Term Shop special episode series on Branson. Today we're going to talk about setup. So we're going to talk about everything you need to do to get your property set up to be ready to go on the OTAs like Airbnb or Verbo. So that's everything from people, decor, rehabs, all that stuff, anything setup related. And we have a great panel today, Bill, who you're already familiar with, but Bill, say hello. Hello. Try to introduce myself again. I mean, you've done it uh, seven, eight, eight times already, but for those <laughs> who might just be jumping in on this, this episode, go right ahead. My name is Bill. I am a real estate agent here in Branson, Missouri. I work primarily with short-term rental buyers and sellers have a background in vacation rental buying consulting. And yeah, I've been an uh, agent here in Branson since 2020. Awesome. And next we have Holly Jones. Holly, you want to introduce yourself really quick? Hey guys, I'm Holly Jones and I own and operate a business here in Branson called Branson Upstaging. And I specialize in short-term rental interior design and setup. Awesome. So exactly the right person for this episode. Really happy to have you. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. So let's say I've just bought a property in Branson. I've just closed, got all that stuff done. We've talked about that in previous episodes. So I'm ready to start getting my property ready. I guess I need a permit, right? How do I go through that process? You know, I I jokingly mentioned uh, ripping this right from Tyann when she posted something on Facebook. So, I mean, basically you register with the state of Missouri for sales tax ID um, when you enter the address for your property, state will tell you what your tax rate is. Uh, also tell you how frequently you need to remit sales tax. This is interesting because in the city of Branson, I want to say it's quarterly. And then if you're like in Taney County and you're, you know, your address is Branson, you do it annually. I know that because that's what the one that I own is. So, um, yeah. And then, you know, be, be sure to file your sales tax form according to how state sets you up. Um, you know, there's, there's filling in the form, remitting the sales tax, easy to do with their website. So it's just one of those things that it's not a huge process. You just kind of go knock it out and then, yeah, you just manage it on an ongoing basis. So it's it's just one of those that like, as long as you're in the zoned areas, like it shouldn't be a challenge. It's like, it's for someone who's trying to go do something that's not in a zoned area to do it would be like having to go get special use permit, but like chances of doing that are almost slim to none. So it's not even something I even like put out as like an option for people because it's just so hard to do. So. Okay, cool. Is there anything that could keep you from obtaining a permit? So say you buy a property and they come out and like, there's, do they look at anything? Do they do any type of inspection? Are they going to say you're deck rails aren't close enough together and so you can't have a permit or anything like that? Main thing is the fire inspection. So this is something that they're requiring that when you're getting set up, they have the fire department actually go out and um, you have to pay them a little bit of money to go do it. I think it's less than hundred dollars to go do, but they will go out to the property to make sure that there's a sprinkler system set up. So that's something that if it's a really large property, there's certain like, like water pressure they need to check on. And it, they just want to make sure that if there's like ever a fire, like, you know, these, these systems are there to, to prevent people from having, you know, a house burn, burn down. So this is for condos, this is for 
single family home, uh, single family home style properties. So that's something that like a good example would be like, if you're in downtown Branson, you've got like this medium density, which is like just the way the zoning code is. It's like, theoretically, you can go ahead and have that as a vacation rental, but the requirement is you'd have to have the fire suppression system installed. So people can, people can do that retroactively. I mean, most single family homes do not have fire suppression installed in them. So it's like, that would be one extra hurdle if someone wanted a property that's like, you know, commercial zone or something a little bit different. So this is just one of those really weird nuances of our area that like, okay, if you're going to do something a little different, then you have to do this. So. Okay, cool. So the permitting process is pretty straightforward, pretty cheap, not mm-hmm. really a big deal as long as you bought in the right zone, right? Yep. I've never had anyone like have a problem with it. Maybe a couple of people get confused by like, oh, I don't know what website or how do I do it, but never have had anyone like not be able to go do it once they've done the right things. All right. Awesome. So let's talk about the property itself. So first we'll talk about furnishing and decor, and then we'll talk about, you know, what are we ordering to stock the property with for guests? So uh, I have found over time, I really enjoy picking out things for, you know, if we're rehabbing a kitchen, I really love picking countertops and tile and stuff like that, but I will spend so much time doing that, that I will just stop and just put it all down and give myself analysis paralysis about it. So I've found that I really am better off just hiring that out uh, because I'll just never do it. I'll never actually get it done. I'll just browse until the end of time. So Holly, I'd really like to hear your thoughts on um, setting up on decor for these things because a lot of them are condos. So maybe we need to differentiate. Uh, Yeah. Let's talk about furnishing and decor for a minute. Are. Okay. So typically um, there are two distinct categories um, as far as who come to me. Um, and so there are the DIYers that really do um, have the time to set up their own short-term rentals. And, you know, that's fine, but there is a strategy that takes place in setting up a short-term rental that's actually different than decorating your own home. Or than even different than you know a hotel or um, decorating a commercial property. So it really is its own niche um, industry, and so that's kind of where I come in. Um, and I really feel like the best um, value that I can help people with, and, and it really is just helping them understand that hey, you've got to start by figuring out who is your target market. So for the people you know, that are curious of like, what's this, where do I begin? What do I start to order? Where do I start to decorate? First, before you buy and order anything, you need to figure out who is your target market. So in Branson, for us, that's a lot of multi-generational families on vacation together. So a lot of what I see, especially in these larger um, buildings that are going up, these larger lodges and whatnot, they are intended for mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, aunts and uncles, a lot of people coming together. So the multi-generational. Now, of course, if you've got a two-bedroom condo um, down near the strip, then that's going to might be like a younger family. Or um, on a golf course, that might be a couple elderly couples vacationing together. So really, depending on where you're purchasing, you need to figure out your target market. And from there, you can start to um, really design and implement your plan for furnishing and decor. Yeah, I totally agree with that because different types of properties will have different guests. So bigger properties attract a different Right. Okay. Uh, Is there anything that you find that you are removing from properties over and over again when (laughs) you are coming into design? So anything we want to most definitely remove because people don't like it. You know, I think that um, too much furniture and um, where where you feel like you walk into a space and you, you can't almost move through the property. They're trying to, you know, outfit this two bedroom condo for 10 people when it really should ideally accommodate six, maybe eight. So a lot of the ones that I go into that I kind of, that need fixing up just have too much cluttered, mismatched furniture. And so that, that's what I like to remove is all the mismatched old outdated pieces. 
Um, otherwise, you know, when when we when you're starting from scratch, it's really um, it's really just thinking about the pieces that are going to fit the families that are coming in there that are going to last, but they're also mid range in budget. Most investors, you don't need to overspend on furniture. There's a fine line kind of in that middle of where you don't want to go cheap. You don't want to put a bunch of stuff together that, you know, um, takes hours and hours to assemble and then breaks within the first hour of people getting there. But at the same time, you don't need to overspend and get super high end interior design level furniture either. So, okay. Makes sense. And are we, what kind, what level of finishes do we have to have to be successful here? So for example, in properties that I've owned, I had one property that was my top performer. It still is a really high performer, but for the first three years that we owned it, it had laminate countertops and was doing really well. Like it was fine. There was no need to go in and update it because it was doing what it needed to do without. Now we have since updated it because we had to update some other things. So we said, well, we'll just go ahead and do the kitchen now anyway. uh, What level do we need to be at to to just get going here? Do we have to go in and rip out kitchens and bathrooms and all that as soon as we buy something? I think think we're seeing it increase like over time, right, Holly? Like Mm -hmm. The bar is being pushed higher and higher, Mm -hmm. but honestly, it's been set pretty darn low to begin with. I mean, Mm -hmm. we're seeing like 1993 green carpet, brass, light fixtures, you know, original cabinetry, like you said, laminate counters and furniture that you're like, man, this, this, how old is this? Right. It could be 30 yeah. years. Old. Right. And that is like the, what I would call almost the never been upgraded. Um, and then, it, you know, it scales all the way up to people that have, you know, crown molding and quartz, granite, uh, right. stainless appliances, you know, right. everything, everything. So that's like zero to 10. So to be successful, you don't need to be a 10. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it it just, it just kind of depends on what you're shooting for, right? There's different tiers. There's like the luxury tier. There's, you know, your high end, there's mid, mid tier budget friendly economy. So it just depends on what, first of all, where you buy, because if you're the only person in your, uh, in your area, that's like below the rest of the herd, then you probably are in trouble. Um, but if you're kind of in the middle or, you know, you can just kind of look at it by, you know, using the enemy method. Look at your neighbors. What do they look like? If you're kind of on par, then you should be okay. Right. And Avery, to answer that question, um, I think it's it's very um, much of a common mistake that new investors make over um, improving or over selecting their fixtures, their finishes. Um, <clears throat> because a lot of times when when you are at the level where you can invest and you can maybe invest in multiple properties, you know, you probably have a pretty nice kitchen with some really great light fixtures and some really good hardware. And, you know, um, you're not living in a shack. Okay. But at the same time, when it comes to like the vacation rental market, um, the vacation rental owner really needs to look at, okay, how much do they have total to spend on the property? And then where is that money best allocated? And so let's save $10,000 on fixtures and finishes, and let's get some really good quality mattresses in here. And let's get some really great, you know, amenities for the outside, you know, maybe a hot tub or some really cool porch furniture that's going to photograph really well. Everybody's working with a budget. I don't care how much money you have. If you're an investor, you're going to be wise with where you put that money. So I don't recommend going super high end on fixtures and finishes. When I select for my clients, I've got new builds I'm working on right now. I select from the builder grade packages that they give me because I have yet to have a client come to me and say, I want you to pick the very best light fixtures. I want you to pick the very best, you know, hardwood flooring. They're all saying, let's go in and see what they have. And I, I pick from the selections the builder offers. And then from there, we build it up and build it out with furniture and decor and you know photographs and value-adding amenities, things like that. So what you're saying is this is not a market where you do have to go like really high end. Because there are some markets where you do kind of have to go really high end to, because of the, of the the area of the country, you know, maybe, maybe the people who are coming are more from like larger cities. So they expect a higher level. Uh, whereas in Branson, you're not necessarily attracting the clientele that wants like an incredibly high end, like insane property. No. Generally speaking, no. Um, 
there might be that small 10% that come in and, you know, and there are those places out there, but generally speaking, no, that's not the case um, at all. They're here for the experiences, of course, around them. Um, but part of that is making their vacation rental part of the experience. And I, I feel like here, our investors want to put that more into the value adding amenities than they do into the upgraded fixtures and finishes. Right. Okay. That makes sense. So you just want it to be cute. It cute, clean, comfortable doesn't have to be expensive or really, really high end. Right, right. And we're telling this story too. I mean, it takes a little bit of fundage to like tell the story of what you're going to experience at the vacation rental. And so to go beyond just the basic furnishings, you know, if you threw another few thousand dollars in, you know, that you could have put on that upgraded, you know, fixtures and finishes package, but you you made their experience that next level than what what the guy next door is outfitting his, then you're going to be better off and you're going to be money ahead. So the biggest thing to to factor in is just the fact that we have so many that are already set up. So I think people will prejudge a place like, oh, that looks gross. Like, don't even consider it. But it's like, look what it's priced at. That is, you know, 30, 40, $50,000 cheaper than your neighbor. Um, Is it going to take $40,000, $50,000 in furnishing to get it to be better than them? And that's where these opportunities are. I've had a number of my investor uh, buyers that have gotten these ones that are, they're cheaper. They're they're like, they're a value buy. And they're like, we'll take on the work to get it updated and make it better. Um, Where there's like, you know, again, another scale of, it might be good for some people who want to take that on as a project and other people are like, no, I just want it like turnkey, make it awesome. Or I'll do, you know, a handful of things and I don't want it to be a huge project. So, um, but that's, I mean, at least there aren't that many that are like completely empty, naked type properties that you have to go from, you know, absolutely nothing but appliances to, you know, fully furnished. I mean, most of them are already coming with, with, with at least some degree of stuff. Yeah. Gotcha. Is there anything you recommend changing or upgrading? You know, say you get a pretty middle of the road property. Is there any particular thing that you would recommend swapping out, changing, upgrading to really increase your income that people might not think about? Um, my my first one is mattresses. So um, Bill and I recently had a client um, we worked with together. And when I went in to did my do my initial design consultation, I, I literally laid down on the beds. <laughs> and, and then I reported back to the client, these mattresses are terrible. You've got to change these out. You know, this was a, a furnished vacation rental. And she said, oh my gosh, I never would have even thought of that. Or, or I wouldn't have known that until I laid in it, right? And you get that one bad guest review that says, you know, they had a terrible night's sleep. Well, so right, right away there, and especially just to keep them clean and, and, you know, the wear and tear on a mattresses. And then um, probably um, what I see the most of is the patio furniture, just because it is, um, it's outside. So it gets a lot of wear and tear. Um, A lot of people try to go really cheap with that, but it's actually, people love to be outside and the visitors in Branson They're you know, they like to be outside and the weather is typically really accommodating to sitting on the porch in the morning with your coffee, sitting out at night, you know, so I, I think changing out the patio furniture is a, is a great investment to upgrade. If you purchase a place that, you know, you can just put a few thousand dollars in pick and choose what you want to do. Those are two that I go to right away. Yeah, you're right. I hadn't thought about that, but now that you mention it, I do notice a lot of people just trying to like repaint crappy old rocking chairs that are out there instead of getting like the nice Hollywood bright yeah. colored furniture that is cute and it's going to last a long time. They just keep trying to, you know, put lipstick on a pig until that, that rocker breaks, which they will. I have, I have, I've been that person in the past and I'm like, Oh no, these are great. These are great. They just need paint. And then they break immediately. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's a really good one that, that people might overlook. I think uh, kitchens are like one of the first thing people tend to look at qualitatively. So it's like, you don't have to do one thing. It's like, well, you could do the appliances, make them stainless. Or you could just do the counter and just do granite. You don't have to do the cabinetry. Right. Um, Because cabinets tend to be like the big, biggest project that are like, okay, this is going to be like a whole kitchen remodel. So in fact, mine, I just did my counters on and I, I, I think it looks awesome. And another one is fans. You know, if you've got old brass fans that have got like dust on them and you know, those little gills, it's like, these look old, but if you just do a simple hundred dollar upgrade, it's like, it just looks nicer immediately. 
Finally, like the sofa, like if you buy a place that they don't want to have a sleeper sofa, it's like, okay, that, that's like an immediate revenue generating purchase is if you can increase the capacity of the place you're sleeping and have a sleeper sofa. You know, those things do wear down over time as people continue to pull them out, put them back in, pull them out, put them back in. Um, but that's a, that's a big one that it's like, can't almost can't not have it, you know? Mm-hmm. I agree with the light fixtures that, you know, um, our previous conversation there was saying, don't go too high end, but it is such an inexpensive upgrade. If you're going into a space that like around Branson here, you know, the, the nineties builds, um, that, you know, for a hundred, hundred fifty dollars a light fixture, you can go boom, 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 thousand bucks. And you've just upgraded, you know, the interior there to make it look more up to date. So it doesn't scream, you know, I'm 20 years old. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's really not that expensive to change out those brass yeah. fixtures with something a little more updated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about stocking, what we're stocking in these things. So Bill, what are t- people typically providing in terms of, uh, let's start in the kitchen. So I almost said toilet paper. <laughs> that is not in the kitchen. I meant paper towels. Okay. So kitchen, what are we stocking? Are we giving them paper towels? Are we giving them laundry? I mean, dishwasher detergent, um, mm-hmm. coffee. That's a big one. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Uh, coffee, uh, dishwasher pods, um, maybe have some laundry pods for your, uh, washer dryer. Um, I think spices, I think personally, I have, I love going on vacation rental and like go grilling. So put out some like not just like your standard rack, but like go get some like fun rubs. Like that's something a little bit different that I stayed at a uh, vacation rental in Colorado for my sister's wedding. And it was like, heck yeah, they had like a dozen different kinds of rubs. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm doing this. So that's my opinion. I like, I like just a little bit nice, uh, random thing. That's like, okay, this is kind of fun part of the experience. Um, as far as like linens, you know, just making sure what is it one and a half X, the number of guests. So if you sleep 10, have like 15 or so, um, linens available for towels, um, for, for not linens, but like bed sheets, but having like a backup set in the like closet. So in case, you know, something needs to get changed out, something happens, kid, what's the bed? Like never had that happen, but you know, just have that as like a backup. So Nothing, nothing very unique. Oh, don't have pool towels. That's one thing is since a lot of these uh, people come, they'll take the towel down to the pool, have a bunch of kids, you know, they're not keeping track of the towels. So don't, don't provide like beach towels with your vacation rental because people will take them and lose them. So that's something that learned over time. (laughs) Oh, really? Interesting. Cause we, I've always, always have provided pool towels, but our, our pool is in the backyard. So it's a little bit different. Uh, they just, they're big, like they're striped in like a different color than our regular towels. So that people can tell the difference. Um, but yeah, I can see if you're taking them completely off site mm-hmm. down to the community pool, how that could happen. So what are you doing Keurig coffee or are you doing ground coffee? Because this one I feel like is very important because it can really, really make people angry first thing in the morning if they bought like a bunch of Keurigs and they didn't and they got in late last night and then they go, oh, I'm ready for my coffee. And then boom, drip maker, which there is a workaround. I've done it. I just cut open the Keurig, the Keurig pods and put them in the drip maker and it's fine. But not every some people are going to want to hang like hold on to that. So <laughs> what are we doing? Because we have groups generally drip coffee with a just a regular pot, but I've seen both. I've seen people that literally offer both. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think Keurigs are, I've never heard anyone say anything about not having a Keurig. I have had guests ask though, like what kind of coffee maker do you have? That's the most common question I get for my vacation rental um, is what kind of coffee maker do you have? We provide um, a drip and a Keurig and a French press, but I love coffee. So if I could, if I could provide, you know, an espresso machine, like I have at home, I would, but that doesn't make sense, you know? So I think it's also just a little bit, um, towards, you know, the, the owner's preference to, if you're using this space at all for yourself, what would you want to have? But I definitely think, um, you, you need to have a drip coffee maker. The Keurig could be the extra, but in our circumstances in Branson, where you've got a lot of people typically in one, you don't want a line formed at the Keurig for six people waiting to do their one cup of coffee every morning. So I think a Keurig's great if it's an addition. Um, I also think that um, 
the a stainless steel carafe as opposed to a glass carafe is um, a great upgrade. Um, Cuisinart has one of those. And I like it because number one, it keeps the coffee hotter, but you know, you don't have the, the coffee pot breaking, you know, while people are there and then you're, you're calling your cleaner or somebody to come in and switch it out. So just those little upgrades, um, that show that you care, you know, for some people that, um, that's what it takes to book your place as opposed to the guy next door. Sorry. I was on mute. <laughs> I was, what I was saying is we have the dual, the pot on one side and the, um, Keurig on the other, yeah, but it is important that they know before they get there. Yeah. Uh, and I like the spice idea too. There's some cool, just like already stocked spinny, sp spinny is a scientific term, spinny mm -hmm. spice racks uh, on Amazon that you can get that have, you know, most everything people would need. Uh, but then, you know, there is a fine line of what makes sense to provide and then what people may ask for once or twice that really doesn't make sense. So for us, mm -hmm. things like uh, aluminum foil, that's kind of hard to keep stocked. And uh, so I would say, Spices and then some kind of non-dairy creamer, like non-perishable creamer, coffee yes. sweetener, like you can get the little packages, whether it's sugar or stevia or what have you. Uh, the coffee grounds, if you are using a drip, um, I like to provide the like cute coffee grounds uh, mm -hmm. that they can use. Uh, what else? Uh, we have experimented and if it happens to be there, then great. But if not, then we don't promise it cooking spray. But again, that's kind of hard to keep stocked. So, uh, but you know, it's, it's kind of up to you, but you don't want to just have nothing. Cause there's, if you come in late and in the morning, you're like, Oh crap, I forgot coffee. And then you find coffee in the kitchen. You're like, Oh, score. And same thing. I think with, um, if you get in super late and you're starving and there's nothing open. And if there's like maybe a few bags of popcorn or like one of our agents in another market does a, can of or a jar of spaghetti sauce and a pack of noodles. So like if they get there and everybody's just dying, there's something that they'll be super grateful for. They weren't expecting it, but when they see it thinking that they're just going to starve all night, they're like, oh yes. So I like stuff like that too. It And don't promise it. Don't say, yeah, we've got spaghetti. But yeah. uh, when they get there and see that they'll, they'll be really psyched because I've, I've been, been there with the kids before and it sucks. I've been amazed by like things I've gotten at my property that have just accumulated where people are like, they're generous, like they're on vacation, you know, they buy like some olive oil or something and they'll just leave it. It's like, well, that's cool. Thanks. Yes. I love that. <laughs> uh, same with like aluminum foil. It's like some of these things are, you know, it's like, it's not a huge dollar item. So if they just get it, it's like, all right, well, we'll leave it. And there's that like good pay it forward kind of good vibes. You're on vacation, pay it forward to the future guests. And uh, I love that because I've been able to, you know, like not have to worry about, hey, you're the guy that owns this place and we don't have XYZ item. So we're upset. It's like, well, I'm sorry. Like, I wasn't aware. It's the middle of July. I've had seven back-to-back <laughs> -back bookings. Like, I, you know, I wasn't aware of it. But if you know, yeah, yeah. Appreciate people that are There's out there. There's such a doing fine that. line of the cool community paying it forward thing, and then people being like, um, "Excuse me, your last guest left like scraps of of aluminum foil, and I'm pissed off about this." So yeah. you kind of have to just find your thing and and stick with it. But okay, moving on from that. So I, what'd you say? One and a half x the number of guests in towels. So mm -hmm. if you have ten guests, you want to give them fifteen towels. I haven't heard that before. But that mm -hmm. is, I like that. I like to have three sets of sheets, kind of like what you said. So one on the beds, one in the owner's closet. If they have a problem, somebody spills something, they can just text me and we'll we'll tell them how to get it. And then one is with the cleaners usually. Oh, um, air mattresses. I just okay. did an air mattress audit. <laughs> oh, goodness. I, I, I honestly didn't even know because, again, I inherited fully set up one and I never went through and inflated every single air mattress. <laughs> so I was like, okay, let's see, do these in fact work? Because I've had various guests be like, hey, we're having troubles. And you're like, uh oh, well, one of the things with air mattresses is they've got the like button that flips to force air in and fill it up. And then they've got one that if you flip it the wrong way, it basically sucks the air out. So if someone were to troubleshoot that and be like, we can't get it to fill. It's like, well, maybe you flipped it the wrong way. But um. <laughs> Of the three that I had, one was leaking. So I'm glad I bought a another one. So I have contingency plans for air mattresses. And <laughs> what, 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 you know, of all the ironies there, I literally got a call about it like 
a week after I bought another one, they're like, we were just making sure you got an air mattress. You're, like, you're good. I know you're good. So <laughs> highly recommend that. Awesome. All right. So let's move on. Or is there anything decor or stocking related that you think we need to talk about before we move on to people? I, I think for decor, um, having location specific decor is, is really strategic. And um, we that live here um, might think oh, that's, you know, that's tacky or that's overkill or that's too much. And, and there is a, a right way to do it. But if you think about when people are scrolling through the Airbnb images and what is going to drop, they're coming to your location to experience Branson. So what are the things that make Branson iconic? What is your guest coming for? And, you know, there's a list a mile long of that, whether it's, you know, the views, the hikes, the amusement park, um, the lakes, all of those aspects can be brought in through decor um, besides just going to Hobby Lobby and getting that farmhouse chic look going on. That's fine if that's your look for your house, but but I don't recommend that for the vacation rental decor and setup. I definitely think that less is more. So spend a little more on that custom piece of artwork. Don't, you know, spend three or $400 on that. Don't go you know, drop three or $400 on a, on a bunch of stuff that you're going to sit on the wall or sit on shelves and have to dust and clean. And just, it doesn't make a statement, doesn't make an impact. So we really want to tell the story of what the guest is, is going to experience when they come to the area. So um, I definitely think that for decor and, um, and then just anything that you can add for, um, for there. So if you, you know, have a lake house and you have it set up that you can offer a couple, um, kayaks or canoes and you show those in photographs, that's going to automatically elevate you next to the lake house guy that doesn't have any of that to offer, or, you know, a swimming, a, a swimming lily pad, you know, that they could use to take on their boat if they rent a boat. You know, those things are expensive to rent, but they're not they're not really expensive for an initial investment. Um so just looking at, you know, um board games, showing those in your photographs. These are just kind of the little things you can add into to the decor that um also also help them have a better experience. Totally. My in-laws love playing Monopoly on vacation. And I feel like such a jerk because I hate Monopoly anyway. It's entirely too long. And I feel very trapped about Mm -hmm. 25 minutes in. I like short board games. And so now I have a little (laughs) bit of like a Monopoly trauma because I just hate playing Monopoly and they always want to play it. And then I look like a jerk. So, but like, there's some really cute, like tic-tac-toe games that mount to the wall and they're magnetic and they serve a purpose of decor, but they're also like, Oh, you could walk up and play a quick game of tic-tac-toe, you know, and it, it kind of looks cool in photographs. It's different. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are kind of the, the types of things to, um, you know, that you can find online with a quick Google search. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just something that looks cool in a picture. Like, Oh, I haven't done that before. Yeah. Let's play that. And a little bit different than what, what you've got at home, you know, a yeah. little bit that leveling up. So yeah, awesome. I totally agree with that. Good point. Good point. One thing we, I, from the short-term rental wealth conference was the, the differentiation between a vacation rental interior design and a residential interior design. And I had a perfect example of that when I was looking at a listing recently where it's like, it was a seven bedroom, uh, Branson Cove million dollar lodge. And it looked fantastic, right? But it was extremely color palette, very neutral. And it's like, huh, like it looks amazing, but how is this standing out? Every room you flip through, same paint on the wall, same color furniture. And it's like your eyes almost start to like acclimate to it. And you're you're not like getting that emotional response that you might get with a little bit of a, you know, a mural on the wall or some type of fancy random thing that it's like, what is that? Like the peacocking effect is like, what I like to say is like, yes. cause when I, when I was analyzing, you know, high performance properties working at Evolve, it was like everyone in like Gatlinburg Pigeon Forge had like some sort of pe- peacocking thing or was like, you know, dantler antler railings or, mm-hmm. you know, or upside down canoe light fixture. It's just these things that you're like, what is that? And mm-hmm. I think that's what's so cool about vacation rentals is because People get so focused on what are the numbers? What are the numbers? What are the numbers? What did it do? What did it do? What's it going to do? Mm-hmm. It's like, well, how do you quantify this canoe light fixture, right? It's like right. This is something that, hey, if you don't know how to get your brain to wrap around this, then that's okay. Like you don't have to, but this is something that is is 
an attribute of this asset class that right. you just have to kind of know it when you see it. Yeah. Bill, just to, and Avery, just to make a quick point on the differentiation between the investor um, and the the male brain that's looking at numbers. And a lot of times the, the okay, tell me the numbers. Like you said, well, how does it, how does it um, quantify there? But the people that are planning vacations are typically the females of the household and they're much more emotion driven. And so therefore the decor and um, the presentation and the photos needs to be geared towards pulling, pulling the buyer in emotionally, because at that point, the numbers don't matter. They're if, if they see a space that they're like, this is where my family's, we're just going to have the best vacation here. They're going to book that first over um, over the one that doesn't pull them in. So I do think that there's something to be said about the decor really speaking to the experience um, and the emotions as opposed to um, just sort of like you said, like the residential, uh, you know, the the kind of muted colors, the the same tone on tone color palettes. Those don't really translate well in photographs, and they don't really invoke emotions um, from a potential, you know, renter. So, yeah, I totally agree with that. You are correct. All right, so let's move on to people. So you're gonna need a cleaner. And you're going to need a handy person to start. And then you can kind of build out the rest of your more specialized uh, people from there. Like, you know, if you need a roofer or you probably wouldn't need that with condos, but, you know, an HVAC tech, clients person, things like that. So let's start with cleaners. So what, where are we finding cleaners? At what point in the process do we start talking to them? Do we do it before we get under contract? Do we do it after we close? Let's start there. Great question on timing. I think that's something where I have people asking me like, well, what are, what are the cleaners? And I'm like, we're having our first call about buying in Branson. You haven't even seen inventory of what to look at yet. Yeah. So not not a bad question. It's just the timing of it. It's like that's not a that's not a significant thing at this this particular juncture. So mm-hmm. I would say within once you've gotten through the inspection and you're still moving forward, that becomes the time. Let's maybe start to look at what are some cleaning options. Um, week or two out, some cleaners get like, "Hey, I don't want to be talked to until you own the place." Mm-hmm. I mean, some cleaners, frankly, are really busy. Like they have a business set up where they're like, "We've got a waiting list." Like, we, frankly, we're good. Yeah. Um, but luckily, there's enough uh, young, hungry you know, cleaning individuals, couples, a lot of married couples that are like, we, we own a cleaning company that they're willing to take on business and and, and go for it. So um, it just really becomes a interview process and who you feel comfortable with. And I say with clean, cleaners too, don't, don't go for the rock bottom price because sometimes you're going to get what you pay for. So. I yeah. Think, yeah. I think in general, Avery, um, I've lived in, um, Branson for seven years. And it was, it was definitely an adjustment when um, we came here. What I think I've learned is that because we are a tourist destination um, and the, the infrastructure of the really solid workers and the people that really produce in Branson, those people are booked out and they're really, really busy. And so I do think, like Bill said, of course, it doesn't need to be the first conversation. Like who's my cleaner? Who's my manager? If you haven't even, you know, put anything under contract, but there is something to be said about understanding the the culture and the population here that we have that are the full time residential people, about ten thousand in Branson. There's very few of us to serve the masses of the United States that come here to invest and to rent and to vacation. There's actually very few of us, and so you do need to be respectful in the fact that don't don't give, you know, the cleaner, the handyman, the designer a phone call and expect turnaround within a week. Because like Bill said, the good ones are booked out and busy. So, you know, give the respect of the time that, okay, let's get you on the schedule and let's not expect, you know, because if you want that, then you've got, then you're going to get what you pay for. You're, if you can get somebody to show up within a week to do something, you know, you might want to be there to supervise it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so. Gotcha. Yeah. I just think that's something that that people don't understand if they don't live here. I deal with a lot of out-of-state clients and they don't understand what, you know, even I'm working with trying to get people to help me set these properties up. I've designed it, I've ordered, I've furnished, but then I need boots on the ground help. You know, it's it's a lot of timing and a lot of stuff goes into finding those right people because there's just not enough of us to go around for the amount of demand. Yeah, it really does. And speaking of demand, so 
one thing that I want you guys to avoid as investors, I see a lot of people say, well, I want, I don't want a company. I want a person. I want a person. And I want it to be the same person every time. And I, I don't want them to ever have a team member or anything else. And I get it because they want, you know, somebody who's cleaned this a hundred times is going to notice, oh, you know what? That's out of place. This needs to be fixed. I get that. But in order for a cleaner to be able to make money and like live, they have to be able to clean a certain amount of properties. And in order to do that, especially in peak times, you know, if it takes them two hours to clean a property and they've got to clean five that day, they can't do that. So you, you have to be okay with a team or a company. Uh, because people have to live, they have to make a living. And um, you also don't want just one single person either, because then they, if anything goes wrong, if somebody gets sick, something like that, you want to be able to have coverage. So my recommendation is a small company. Uh, and also I in Branson, in an area like this, where it's a very established vacation market, the infrastructure for having a lot of cleaners and handymen and people like that is there. You're not having to train, in most cases, a primary homeowner housekeeper or primary home housekeeper and train them how to turn a vacation rental. These guys all already know what they're doing and have their processes. So my recommendation is not to come in and try to change their process because you watched a YouTube and somebody said to do it a certain way. Uh, let them do, let them run how they run. They know what they're doing. In most cases, they've all worked for big property management companies. They're doing this all the time. So, you know, you may have a few extra things like, oh, you know what? I want to make sure we set out this gift basket or, or whatever. Uh, but don't come in and try to change their entire process of what they're doing because you want your cleaner to want to work for you. Your cleaner is your most important person on your team and you don't want them to not like you. You need to treat your trainer treat your cleaner like gold because they are. So it's always, of course, have the conversation of how do you work and make sure you're hiring someone whose communication style and way of working matches yours. But I would not come in with and make people like check off a thousand boxes of a checklist every time they clean and send it to you. So work with their processes. Maybe you need to add a thing or two, but don't try to come in and, and change it. Um, yep. yeah. And typically where are we finding these types of people's uh, types of people's, these types of vendors? So cleaners, handyman, we find in them local Facebook groups. I know Bill, you've probably got some recommendations. Just over time, you create a list, grow the list, keep, you know, adding to it, the Rolodex of contacts. And then, um, interesting thing with like for handymen, for example, it's one of those jobs that it's not like a big contractor job that they're going to do for 15, 20 years. You know, they, you might have them for a year or two. And then they're like, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to slow down. I'm, I'm getting to that age where I just, you know, my back starts to hurt. I don't want to do this no more. You know, okay. All right. So having multiple hand backup handymen is important just because you want to rotate around. All right. First of all, who does a really good job, but then, you know, in case A is not available, we have plan B and plan C. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, that's, you can go on groups, find them. A lot of times people actually start out with their own, that they're they're cleaning themselves and they're like, you know what, we'll clean it for others. So they'll put themselves out there. But yeah, it's, it's luckily in our area, as long as we're within 30 minutes of everything, like you're good, we'll have options. You start to get way too far out on the lake, far away from Branson, then it's like, I don't know who is out there. Good question. Right. Yes. And in that case, um, if you do have a remote location in Branson um, as for a short-term rental, then um, you just need to be prepared to pay more if you want, you know, for your cleaner, for your handyman. Um, if, if, you know, in, in my case, if, if I'm driving an hour each way to set up a short-term rental, it's going to cost more for my services than if it's right downtown here in Branson. Um, it's just it's time and it's travel. So I just think um, just be prepared for that um, unless you just find that really great, you know, neighbor out there that's the stay at home mom that will clean and, you know, her husband does handyman work on the side. Those, ki those kind of people exist and, and that's golden if you, if you land on that. But that's something that, you know, I just, I would say would be a fair warning if you're getting a remote location for, um, an Airbnb and you want quality people to run it, then it's going to be a little bit more expensive. Totally. Anything else related to sourcing vendors or interviewing vendors that we haven't covered that you think people would benefit from hearing? I think that um, what I've noticed here is that a lot of the solid referrals come from word of mouth. Um, but 
beyond that, you know, word of mouth could also mean, you know, um, so, you know, somebody's tagged, you know, 10 times in this one Facebook group, but, you know, they happen to be friends with all the people that run that Facebook group. So it might not be as legitimate as it seems because, hey, all the people that recommended them are actually all their family and friends. And so do a phone interview. Um, and then if they, you know, if they have um, a website, of course, look at their website, but um, definitely take a couple people, you know, when you're, when you're doing with word of mouth, don't just go with that one person and then, you know, be mad at everybody for recommending, you know, this person didn't work out. Well, did you vet them, you know, have that phone conversation and do that with two or three people before you decide, because like you said, it's gotta be someone also that you jive with that, you know, that you, you are on the same page with as far, far as how you want to operate your business and how they operate their business. And yeah. And I would, if you're getting on Facebook groups and saying, Hey, I'm buying in Branson and I need a cleaner and you get a bunch of recommendations, make sure all of the people that you're getting those recommendations from have actually used this vendor. And it's not just like a bunch of friends and cousins where somebody said, Hey, please, here's a link to this Facebook. Everybody go recommend me because I do see that happening a yes. lot and it's, it's just really easy to do. So just vet your recommendations. Just say, Oh, Hey, uh, have you used this person before? And if they say, mm -hmm no, she's my cousin. Well, then, you know, maybe that's not the best source of recommendation. Very true. All right, guys. So we're about out of time. Is there anything else related to the setup process that we didn't talk about that you think our listeners would benefit from hearing? No, I would just say Branson's easy to get started with because we've got, you know, all of our properties that are turnkey, like you could literally close and have a guest checked in that evening. So it is one of these one of these markets that you do not are not absolutely required to have to go through the um, exercise of getting it set up, but it's always something to be thinking about because you want to know what your what your asset that you've just picked up is going to be able to produce in a relative sense compared to um, what the rest of the market looks like. So that's not something that I get. I just get to tell a client like, here, here's what I think. It's like you, it's definitely put that on the client to kind of do a little bit of homework. Like go on Airbnb, find your building or go on Verbo, find your area. Look what your neighbors are doing, right? And now don't don't get guilty feeling like, oh my gosh, they've got such a nice place. Well, they probably overspent. So don't feel bad. But at the same time, like if you're like, okay, that is a good idea. They did this particular mm -hmm. thing. It's like, just just do a little, just put a little bit of brain power into it and it's going to pay off. That's all, that's all I got to say. And Bill, yes, I think um, you're right in in the sense of the ones that are already furnished and ready to go. I'm currently working on 12 new builds, furnishing them and um, for different investors. And so speaking to that, I would say if someone is looking at buying a new build, um, there is a sweet spot in starting your setup process. So six months prior to completion is too far, in my opinion, in, in my professional opinion, let's put it that way. It's too far because if things get ordered, there's there's a lot of um, logistics that have to happen in order to get those ordered pieces into the property. And um, so if you just have, you know, an entire household for, full of furniture floating around and you have nowhere to put it because the builder is out three months over, then th that'll cause you a lot of time and headache figuring that out. So, you know, three months prior, when you're really within that, you know, range, if you can see that close range, they're almost done, then you can definitely start pre-ordering and, and making your lists and, and buying your inventory. Um, but doing it too far in advance causes everybody um, a headache and it actually doesn't, it doesn't get anything done any quicker. Um, so uh, every investor would love to have this magical shoot that where, you know, the pieces of the property and the furniture and the decor and everything falls in, you know, down this slide and <laughs> right into the property the minute, you know, the, the construction crew says we're done. But um, that just isn't the case. So I think if you're looking at a new build and you're doing it completely from the ground up, I think three months is, is a sweet spot um, because you're close enough um, to start the ordering um, and, and supplying process, but you're not so far out that then you have the problem of what do I do with all this stuff now that, and I have nowhere to put it. Mm -hmm. Totally agree with that. Great, great advice. Well, guys, if you want to buy with Bill in Branson, you can email us at agents at the short term shop.com and we will get you connected with him. Or if you just have more questions, there's a few ways that you can get those answered. So you can join our Facebook group. It's called short term rental, long term wealth, same title as my book. Or every Thursday, we have a live Zoom Q&A and you can sign up for that at strquestions.com. Thanks, guys. Thank Bye. you.